This documentary project is a study of the formation of Russism as an ideology of modern Russia, which resulted in the Russian-Ukrainian war. At sunrise on February 24, 2022, I, like millions of Ukrainians, woke up to explosions and the sound of cruise missiles. A terrible year of losses began, the deaths of friends and colleagues, broken fates, the destruction of our country. This whole story with Russia is a story of genocides of various kinds. Europe hasn't witnessed a larger-scale war since 1945. In Ukraine, we often quoted Ivan Franko. This is a last war. It's when humanity confronts bestiality in battle. Now it is a war that is closing the Gestalt. I think this is our last war. We will win and we will emerge stronger. In a sense, this is a Greco-Persian war. And the Greco-Persian wars do not end any other way, only with the victory of freedom. I, Miroslava Barchuk, a journalist and TV presenter, will ask Ukrainian and Western intellectuals why we are in this war, how long has it been going on, and how the whole world could become a hostage to a madman and the collective insanity of his people. And on the other hand, where did Ukrainians find the strength to endure the blow, withstand and achieve victories that nobody in the world believed in? This is the last war, the last huddle, after which Ukraine will be independent. Last war. Russia's war crimes in Bucha. The year 2022 brought us numerous of serious upheavals. Perhaps the hardest of them is the scale of inhuman cruelty of the Russian military against Ukrainians. Mass killings, execution pits, torture chambers, concentration camps, rapes, forced deportations, and child abductions. The Bucha massacre will be included in textbooks on the history of war crimes. Upon returning to Russia, the 64th Brigade, which committed these crimes, received the honorary title of Guards for Exemplary Actions during the war against Ukraine. Many armies commit crimes, but for the Russian army, crimes are a modus operandi. Unfortunately for me, Bucha is a pattern. I can say that I was surprised. But I can say that I was shocked, shocked that this is happening in the 21st century. We thought it was all in the past, and suddenly it turns out it's still relevant. Immediately after the deoccupation of Bucha, when the crimes of the Russians became known to the whole world, the Russian official news agency RIA Novosti published an article by Russian philosopher and political strategist Timofey Sergeyev. Why should Ukrainians be enemies of Russia? All of this has been loaded into the consciousness of an entire generation of people. To put it bluntly, if we want to change situation, we will have to re-educate the population of the whole country. Sergeyev's article is a program for the full elimination of the Ukrainian nation per se. American historian Timothy Snyder referred to this article as a genocide manual. This war has a genocidal nature. They aim to destroy the nation. The most active elements that create culture, create politics, and everything we call out national existence. The first things that comes to mind is to find out who are these people who came and committed these crimes. What constitutes Russia? The seller of Europe with the vilest worms of human history, has never been opened, ventilated, and has had no legitimate assessments. Russian fascism can legitimately be called Russian fascism. Today's Russia fits perfectly into the classical definition of fascism by historians and anthropologists. Ancestor worship, cult of the leader, cult of sacrifice, conspiracy theories, aggression, imperial longing for the golden age, everything is like right out of the textbook. We will talk about the events and phenomena of modern Russian history that explicitly or implicitly nurtured Russian fascism.
It all started with a yearning for the empire. In times when the USSR was already dying. We all then nearly felt the main future of the communist system, that it has two heads. On the one hand, it was a totalitarian regime, but at the same time, it was an empire, a colonial regime. In 1990, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, a prisoner of Soviet labor camps and the author of the Gulag Archipelago trilogy, wrote an essay titled How to Rebuild Russia. He sincerely hated Bolshevism, but saw Russia as an empire and proposed creating a new Russian Union. When I proposed the Russian Union in rebuilding, a union of three Slavic republics with the possible participation of Kazakhstan, you can pay attention to the gentle and tender stones I used throughout when talking about the union proposal. This union is vital. The idea of the people who declared the independence of Soviet Russia from the Soviet Union in 1991 was precisely the creation of the ethnic state in which the peoples of Russia, other people of Russia, couldn't play any role. They were the first to declare its sovereignty. For them, it was the path to a better Russia. Take as much power as you can swallow. We will not hinder it in any way. Therefore, the processes continue, as they do. Russian continues to hope that the territories they consider historical Russia will return home. Fourteen Russian regions declared sovereignty. The most notable were the referendums in Tatarstan and the Congress in Chechnya. At that time, the Kremlin was forced to transfer power from the center to the regions through special agreements. Most of these agreements would later be cancelled as unconstitutional. Russia is following the predictable path of a wounded empire that begins to weaken, unable to hold the territories it considers its own, and desperately tries to restore what it considers its former glory. Yeltsin is a person who cannot be trusted. Today he says one thing, and tomorrow he says another. When he came to Kazan, he said, take as much independence as you need. And now united and indivisible Russia is his main thesis. This is a trap of Russian historical development. Russia has never built a political nation. Russia quickly built an empire, but a political nation wasn't created. Optionist commonality, they haven't come up with anything different for 110 nation besides optionist, because all those nation remains nations. But how do you unite a Chechen with a Yakut or combine a Ugra Finns with steppe peoples? That are very difficult task. What do the Buryats and the Dagestanis have in common? to consider themselves Russians. And you always need to tie this country with the help of imperial armature. And you simply call this armature traditional values or spirituals bonds. Spiritual bonds are formulated by the philosopher and ideologue of Russian nationalism, Alexander Dugin, in the book Foundation of Geopolitics, kind of a textbook on conquest. Foundations of geopolitics are still studied in Russian military academies. Dugin's book had a powerful influence on the Russian political elite, intelligence services and the army. His ideas became a virus. If we don't attack, if we don't expand, we will shrink. Any theory that enters the territory of Russia becomes a religious thought. It is not debated within society. There is no traditions of discussing it. 
the empire that constantly exists in the minds of the citizens of a neighboring state is the only form of existence that harmonizes possibly with the internal worldview and how things should be. The collapse of the empire traumatized Russian self-consciousness. This trauma in the late 1990s gives rise to the idea of the Russian world. The concept is formulated by political technologies Yefim Ostrovsky and Pyotr Shedravitsky. The concept of the external Russia, which is Russia beyond the real borders of the Russian Federation, emerges. This concept is developed by Vladislav Surkov, Putin's assistant and the future curator of the occupation of Crimea and eastern Ukraine. How to talk about the empire, about our desire to expand, but not offend the servants of the world community? What is the Russian world? It is everywhere where people speak and think in Russian. That's the first aspect. It's where they may not speak or sing in Russian, but they highly respect Russian culture. It's where people fear Russian weapons. That's also the Russian world. Russians have developed a messianic worldview. They believe they bring justice, they bring truth, and in this way they are saving corrupted humanity. The sense of this mission is imbued in the cult films Brother and Brother Two. Director Balabanov accurately hits the desire of millions of Russians to dictate their truth to the world. The cultural hero Danila Bagrov appears, a veteran of the First Chechen War, a tough guy and a sex symbol who appeals to the masses. The power is in the truth. A massive event in support of Russian servicemen, the powers in the truth took place in Habarovsk. His phrase is Russians don't abandon their own and the powers in the truth become iconic and are written on Russian military equipment, army symbolism and used in the official rhetoric of the Russian authorities. The real power lies in justice and truth, which are on our side. The rise of Putin and the start of the Second Russia-Chechen War. At a certain point, it no longer matters who is at the helm of this system. It could be Stalin, Brezhnev or Putin. He transcends any specific governor. It goes beyond the composition of the Politburo. The emergence of leaders like Putin, Ivan the Terrible and all the rest is the aspiration of the profound nation, as they say. And it horrifies you. Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. I lived in Russia from 2000 to 2010. Putin was democratically elected in 2000 and 2004. I believe based on armed aggression aimed at destroying and mass murdering civilians. He was elected as an authoritarian leader, a strong arm whose main victory was the mass killing of civilians. Putin's popularity soared after a series of terrorist attacks in Russian cities, explosions in residential buildings. There is a compelling version that these explosions were organized by the FSB to unleash the Second Chechen War and bring Vladimir Putin to power. The goal was to spread panic in society and create a demand for a strong arm. And Putin will not disappoint Russians. We will hunt down terrorists everywhere. In the airport, let it be the airport. Excuse me my language, but we will catch them even on the toilet and drown them. That's it, the matter is closed once and for all. Therefore, this is a conscious choice in a democratic environment of the majority of Russians or a sufficient number of Russians who choose such a leader. Russian liberals always say that Putin he imposed his agenda on Russia. 
I'm now more inclined to think that Putin didn't impose his agenda on Russian, but he hit a mark. For me, Putin is something similar to Habesian Leviatha, an allegorical representation of the body politic. And this body politic consists of many, many individuals, corpuscles, the corpuscles of his subjects. So it seems to me that Putin is also such a great body composed of the corpuscles of his subjects, but also of dead bodies. Those very ancient Russia desires, desires for greatness, desires for expansion, desires for imperialism. Meanwhile, the countries on which the desire for expansion is directed, that is to say the states targeted by the doctrine of external Russia, are slipping out of Kremlin's control. Color revolutions are happening one after another in neighboring countries. The Rose Revolution in Georgia, the Orange Revolution in Ukraine, the Tulip Revolution in Kyrgyzstan. Two terrifying words that Putin has learned are Maidan and Orange Revolution. The Putin regime will meet its demise from what is called the Ukrainian Orange Revolution as a model, as a type. The events that took place in 2004-2005 hardly had a distinct anti-Russian element. But Russia reacted very negatively, and such a negative reaction caused, uh, well, the need to comprehend why. What caused this? It turned out that Russian, despite everything, want to preserve the empire, whether it's Yeltsin, Putin or Navalny. Another failure to the Kremlin was the expansion of NATO in 2004. Seven countries, including the Baltic states, joined the alliance, securing themselves from the Russian world. At this time, the rhetoric of official Russian authorities and state media began to use the term Russophobia. Later, this term would allow Russia to disguise oppression under the image of being a victim. So it turns out that NATO is deploying its spearhead forces to our national borders, and we, strictly following the agreement, do not respond to this action in any way. But do we have the threat to resist these threats? Of course we do. While invasion of Georgia and the world's lack of reaction when Russia annexed South Ossetia in 2008, Crimean Tatars were the first to say that Crimea could be next. The plan for a full-scale war against Ukraine was approved in Moscow immediately after the Russian-Georgian war in 2008, and the greatest threat was that soon a young generation would emerge, those who wouldn't remember the Soviet Union, wouldn't have sympathized toward Russia and would look toward the West. It seemed that the war in Georgia demolished the illusions about the end of history and eternal peace. At the same time, the West is not taking real steps to punish Russian aggression. This gives a stimulus to continue annexing territories. Next in line was Ukraine. The only factor that delayed the attack was the election of Viktor Yanukovych as president of Ukraine. For the Kremlin, he was the embodiment of the Little Russia project. I would like to congratulate Viktor Fedorovich Yanukovych on the official entry into office as the president of Ukraine. This is undoubtedly a positive signal for the development of our relation. Thank you. When it became clear that Ukrainians had driven off Yanukovych, it was a personal slap. They couldn't believe it happened spontaneously. From the Russian perspective, it was a blast of the foundations of traditional Russian 
autocracy, which decides how it is reproduced, who it transfers power to, and how it functions. Why can't Russians use force against their own government? Because they didn't exist without government. And the more Russians feel that they will never reach Putin, the more they fear him. Because there is no Russian people. People can only exist as a subject. The main and primary subjectivity of any people is to resist tyranny. Power is tremendous burden, and the masses do not want to be smeared in that power. Therefore, it is desirable to delegate power to one person who will bear this heavy burden. But in return, one has to submit to that person, follow all orders and become one obedient mass. And so, at a certain moment, democracy became synonymous in the eyes of Russian with Ukrainian characteristics and became a sign of anti-Russian sentiment. In March 2014, Russia annexed Ukrainian Crimea. This annexation became an embodiment of the Russian world doctrine. It required years of ideological groundwork about the eternal Russian lands, protection of compatriots and historical rights to Crimea. In 2014, I have a conversation with a college, and all acquaintances, a very good person in it. We were sitting in her apartment in Moscow, and she said, don't get offended, but can I be honest with you about what's going on inside me? I said, go ahead, speak up. She said, I understand everything, the annexation of Crimea, it's wrong what happened, but for some reason I feel so good that Crimea is ours. And I looked at her and said, do you even hurt yourself? The basis for this is the children killed in Crimea and Donbass every day, Mariupol, Bucha, Irpin, Hostomel, every city where the so-called soldiers enter, because they have nothing to do with real soldiers. That's the basis of their barbecue parties, their spiritual communication under the warm Crimean sun on my land. Russian propaganda at that moment in 2014, they went crazy, they went off the rails. Ukraine, the situation there is such that it is appropriate to talk about the end of statehood. You can fulfill all your darkest desires. Right there, where the duck is swimming. Drown those children, drown them, right in the Tisa river. They will feast on them moosely. And this is their organic way of thinking. They genially feel this way. They speak like that. In the frame, everyone is shouting, screaming, interrupting each other. Their words and voice become a form of coercion. And in addition, they were fueled with aggression for 20 years, very skillfully and technologically. They need to kill all of them, the holes to the last one, and kill children. It's rot, it needs to be eradicated. The entire population. The entire population. Until we kill all of them, we cannot stop. Until we eliminate all the Nazis. If a Russian calls someone a nationalist, a Bandera follower, a fascist, it relieved them of the obligation to be human. With such an enemy you can do anything you want. In the Chelos Russian perception of Ukraine, there is something more than just nostalgia for empire. It rather resembles resentment, a 
feeling of hostility or powerless envy towards those whom Russia considers the cause of its failure in life. Today's resentment of Russians is reminiscent of the well-known Weimar era resentment of Germans in the 1920s and 30s. It was a time when Germans couldn't come to terms with their defeat in World War I and sought culprits, including the Jewish conspiracy known as the stab in the back. This theory was popular in Germany before and during the Nazi regime. When talking about Russian resentment, we must speak in general about how this phenomenon arises. You live in poverty, in destitution, someone in the cause of your disgraceful state. We are constantly falling behind. We cannot compete with the West no matter how hard we try. Despite our immense size and ambitions, the material condition of life somehow don't work out, they fall apart. But then who is to blame? Where to find this justice? Apparently it must be someone else, someone foreign, beyond the borders of your country. The successful work of the collective CIA, which has been trying to dismantle our own country for many decades and continues to do so today. Amid the ongoing war against Ukraine, which has been going on for two years now, in 2016, they created their own version of the Hitler Youth, called the Unarmia, a children's military organization. The organization is managed by the Russian Ministry of Defense and prepares new records for the Russian army. Adhere to the Unarmia Charter. Be an honest Unarmiet. I swear. The militarization of children's minds begin in press schools. Congratulations on Victory Day. This is completely normal for the civilization development of any former empire. Former empires always focus on the past, not the future. Our grandfathers fought. We can repeat, meaning we will once again demonstrate this blind, irrational will. It's not just an eternal return to some same state. It's a kind of reproduction of the golden age, a return to the best state that can possibly exist. And of course, the golden times should belong only to Russia. The Kremlin not only nurtures the myth of our grandfather's fault, but also persistently appropriates the laurels of the victors. The participation of other nations of the USSR in the Second World War is silenced, as well as the assistance of Western allies. In the Russian myth of victory, there is no Churchill or Roosevelt, there is only Stalin. There is a clear market, the victory in the Second World War, which is specifically called the Great Patriotic War, not the Second World War. Why? Because only the Russian people emerge victorious. There is the appropriation of victory and the appropriation of history. Congratulations on the opening of the monument to the saint equal to the Apostles Prince Vladimir. The new monument is a tribute to our distinguished ancestor. The monument to Prince Vladimir in Moscow, erected in 2016, was done because Russia still feels lost in both time and space. It fails to see its own prospect or its own roots. They have merged the history of uh, Ukraine with their own history, thus creating a millennium-long history of Russia. If Ukraine reclaims its own history, then Russia is left without a southern tier history. It was crucial to show that Kyiv and Rush is a forerunner of the Moscovy. The Moscovy is the forerunner of the Russian Empire, and the Russian Empire is the forerunner of the Soviet Union and the Russian Federation is the successor of the Soviet Union. It's about the idea of the Third Rome, which obtains this holiness and the Third rome so to speak, through Kyiv. And when Kyiv turns out not to be part of your political reality, it means uh, you need to reconsider this whole idea. 
that has lasted for centuries. It means you have to give up your own legitimacy and even your sources of pride. Either we are everything with Ukraine or without Ukraine. We are not just we but minus Ukraine. We become nothing. Prince Volodymyr has forever entered history as a gatherer and defender of Russian lands, who lay the foundations of a strong, unified, centralized state by uniting different peoples, languages, cultures and religions into one large family. This Russian fascism is built on the idea of empire and orthodoxy. When studying the history of the Russian Orthodox Church, one is amazed at how intertwined it is with the history of the Russian state and how much the church life has influenced the entire country's life. When studying the history of the Russian Orthodox Church, one is amazed at how intertwined it is with the history of the Russian state and how much the Church's life has influenced the entire country's life. Russians interpret Christianity as an addition to the empire, as an ideology of the empire. It is an ideological tool for legitimizing the empire, while Christianity, from its roots, has been an idea of a community that opposes tyranny. I believe that uh, not only Kirill Gundyayev as one of the ideologists of the Russian world should be condemned, but also the Russian world itself as an ideology, as a non-Christian ideology. As something similar to fascism, Nazism, communism or other ideology that, in this case, hide behind religion. A striking example of hybrid Russian orthodoxy is the main cathedral of the Russian armed forces, the Church of the Resurrection. It is filled with military symbols and signs of force waged by Russia. The cult of war in the cathedral is blessed by the Mother of God and the saints depicted in icons. The military cathedral near Moscow is the metaphor for all of Russia in the 20s of the 21st century. Militarism, chauvinism, superiority and the desire to seize foreign territories. On the stairs we took track from German tanks and they are incorporated into these stairs as an alloy. Fragments of German tank tracks and remnants of shield and mines. Climbing the stairs on this cathedral, we are walking on the weapons of the defeated enemy. It is a very simple and terrifying metaphor. Now it completely takes Russia out of time and puts it in a non-civilization context. My country, my state and my leader elevate this country to heavenly heights, to the divine, but we have a direct connection with God. That is, through us, through our people, God speak himself. Russian orthodoxy, it seems to me, is enchanted by the death of Christ. This pleasure from suffering, this pleasure from one's own suffering, this is the first step. And the second step is what it turns into, into a terrible formula. Whoever is capable of killing themselves is worthy of becoming the executioner of the world. An interesting way of testing fate – go, slaughter, destroy nation. Can God test fate in this way? Apostle Paul say that our chiefs, people's chiefs, we are a sword at their waist to testify that they have been given the authority to uphold divine law. They have the right to punish, to interrupt earthly destinies and to provide people with the opportunity to realize even through such a terrible event as the loss of life. In Russian tradition, a citizen can belong only to the state. 
only the state can be the manager of one's own destiny. Russians are merely fuel for the imperial machine. With our great Russian community, they can do whatever they want without hesitation. They can humiliate us, torture us, punish us. Our own lives have no value. We have no dignity. So why, if we are worth nothing, should we value the lives of others? Some life will barely survive. It's unclear how they trap her off, the vodka or something else. But your son lived. Do you understand? His life turned out to be important. Our boys are doing just fine. I'm proud. I have another son at home. If needed, I will send the third one too. This uh, sinful world is full of evil that we have to accept, like some natural disaster. Accepting dictatorial regimes, including those that are absolutely cannibalistic, as uh, something that happens uh, like hail or uh, drought. The mass Russian, what they themselves call the deep people, is the mental descendant of the Serb peasant, the Serb. And if serfdom lasted less than a hundred years in Ukraine, in Russia it lasted three hundred and more. Up to 15 years in prison, repressions in Russia are intensifying. A thousand and one person detained, this is the Russian reality. Memorial is one of the oldest human rights organizations in the Russian Federation. Human rights activists believe that there were no legal grounds for the organization's liquidation. In late 2021, Memorial was banned in Russia, recognizing it as a social threat. Prosecutors accused this human rights organization of distorting historical memory. Memorial has been studying the great Stalinist terror for 32 years, documenting the fates of innocent people who were executed, imprisoned or persecuted during Soviet and post-Soviet times. No Russian authorities has ever repented for the crimes of the Soviet tragedy. The present evil is the offspring of past evil that the present evil is the result of the previous evil. Stalinist evil, preceded by Leninist evil, preceded by Tsarist evil, and so on, is the result of the non-condemnation of this evil. Instead of comprehending, evil had to be hidden, the map of historical memory had to be reformatted, and history had to be substitute that is come up with. That is exactly what Putin does in the article about the unity of Russians and Ukrainians. The appeal to destroy Ukraine and the Ukrainian nation was already voiced in an essay written by Vladimir Putin. It was published in July 2021. And the same theme that Ukraine hasn't right to exist. That Ukraine is a legitimate formation historically, legally, and so on, was heard in Putin's speech, which was actually a declaration of war. I have decided to conduct a special military operation. Hostile anti-Russia is being created on our historical territories. The so-called Western Bloc is the same empire of lies. In February 2022, Ukraine was attacked by prison. In order to understand this very deep Russia, the true Russia, acceptable, the most adequate key to that can and should be served by criminal psychology. Either you're a boss or you're a flunky, period. Either you're that louse and your place is next to slop pail. Or you're a boss who has the right to stab anyone in the cell. 
We have a lot of experience in dealing with the Russian society, which uh, regularly repeats the same position regarding us. Either you are a master or a slave. To become a master, you must reach this position through violence. The only way to assert yourself when you are constantly under tremendous pressure from above in this hierarchy is to apply violence to those beneath you. A Russian soldier told his mother how he was tormenting Ukrainians and his mother said, oh, I would enjoy it with you. If I were there, I would also get a kick out of it. We are the same after all. And then they ended the conversation by saying it would be nice to apply all this to the, well, the father of this solar. So here is the plan. Let's do glazing 21 woods. We will start with his dick. If he won't understand, we will do five more. No, you know where we should begin. We will break his finger, the most important one, the index finger on his right hand. So he won't point or pick his nose? Why did they derive pleasure from torturing? Because of the lack of empathy. And no, just the lack of empathy. You can be absent-minded, but still have a cold attitude towards something. But here is the thrill of knowing that they are destroying something within you, and they want to break your dignity through your body. It's the absence of empathy and moral immaturity of a weak child who tears the wings off of insects. And here's a whole country of these weak, neglected, unloved teenagers who are always ready to experiment, whether it's uh, cutting up cats or even more exciting, cutting up people. The Russian world is sadomasochistic, where there is only one, one model of communication. It's the communication of violence. You either become a victim of violence or you become a perpetrator of violence. You either commit violence or suffer from it. Ukrainian villagers who experienced the occupation told not only about violence, tensions and abuse. They testified that Russian soldiers looted everything from Ukrainian homes from electric kettles to washing machines, toilets, and even women's outerwear. It became clear that what was ordinary for Ukrainian villagers appeared as unprecedented luxury to soldiers from rural Russia. What is the Russian army? It's also a social elevator to some extent for people living in poverty and for those dreaming of impunity, because they feel at a lower stage of the social ladder. And these people find themselves in a situation where everything is permitted, where killing, raping and looting are welcome. So they behave, by the way, like the Soviet army in Germany in 1944-45. And not only in Germany, but also in other European countries. These are the grandchildren and great-grandchildren of the same people who fought. People from the Russian countryside suddenly see a normal civilized life with all those kitchen gadgets they have never seen before. And all this evokes anger, it evokes a desire to seek revenge for the fact that you live better than us. There is a lot of evidence that Russians leave their excrement in the most incredible places. The sink is covered in feces, we barely managed to clean it, and they defecated on pillows and used boy shorts to wipe themselves. There's the half of a sack of it. Well, orcs, what can you expect from them? This metaphor of defecation, that they don't care about the whole world, they don't care about themselves, it's a perverted sense of freedom, in my opinion, a freedom they don't have. They don't have that space of freedom, so they express it only for themselves in some, in such another form of violence as an alternative to systemic violence, another form of bullshit as an alternative to systemic bullshit.
The silence of Russian intellectuals is striking in this war. And even when they speak, I'm struck by what they talk about. They don't talk about ideas that are important for their society. They largely talk about themselves as a separate class and about the threat to themselves as separate communities. Russian intellectuals often refuse a Russian reality and invent another Russia, a parallel one. They claim that a true Russia is not equal to Putin and that Putin does not speak and act on behalf of all Russians. There are two completely separate Russians. They have completely different ideals, completely different heroes. Those who are heroes to us are enemies to them, and vice versa. This year I am convincing all my interlocutors that we cannot talk about the general support for the war among Russia. It's not like that at all. I am convinced that the real Russia wants peace for both Russia and Ukraine, and the absence of that peace is a real tragedy for it. A rejection, in fact, of the role of an intellectual who should be a pain receptor within society. They rarely use the word war. For example, they say, our boys are dying. But they still return to the thesis that the Russian people are victims. The inability once again to take responsibility to say that it's my fault here. I would help the Russian people who died in Ukraine, because they may not understand, so to speak, how to say it. They may have been victims of propaganda and went there to fight, but their families who were left without breadwinners, that also a terrible tragedy. We need to talk about humanitarian aid for the victims of war in general, for everyone. Imagine a Russian intellectual without the Russian Empire. Who would they be? Who need them? Where will they find their place? Do they really want to build a free, liberal democratic society in Russia? And won't it turn out that this society, for example, cannot integrate such infinite spaces that Russia currently encompasses? and that Russia will shrink to the Moscow region or a few more cities. Are they ready to live in such a country? Are they ready to give up the comfortable life they used to have, which was provided by simply plundering the resources of Siberia? That's why it seems to me that they also dream of their own empire. It's just that this empire should be somewhat humane, good. It doesn't mean, I think, that we should condemn all people just because they have a Russian passport. I believe that good people exist everywhere. It's just that Russian liberals can help us in any way, so they are indifferent to me. Sooner or later, what everyone expects will happen. Sooner or later, we will win. It is right to call it a sacred war. Goida, battle cry, brother and sister, Goida. This morbidity, this sadomasochistic narrative, they are the heart of Russian historical and cultural identity. And that's why they are afraid to be cured, because if they are cured, they will become someone else. In order for Russia to exist without Ukraine, they need to redefine their identity as a society, how they see themselves, how they perceive their history. The existence of Ukraine is a huge challenge for the current Russian identity. That is, it cannot exist when Ukraine exists. But the final question, perhaps the most painful one, is what do Russian think in general? It seems that they have bought into the imperial narrative formulated by Putin. They feel that they cannot be safe within their own Russian identity if they do not dominate all the surrounding countries. This somehow explains the lack of protest actions by Russians outside of Russia and the fact that there has not been significant mobilization in Russia so far. 
This may change if Russia continues to suffer further military defeats are quite evident, but for now the ongoing war still receives sufficient support from the population in Russia. What is the correct term for the social evil that permeates all layers of Russian society? Is the term fascism sufficient in the Russian context? Is it correct to call this phenomenon fascism, which was a severe illness of Italian society? Or Nazism, which the Germans suffered from in the last century? These nations recovered, acquiring strong immunity. It seems that the situation with Russians is more complex. It doesn't really look like an illness. It's rather a part of their identity that they don't want to lose. An identity for which freedom, justice and democracy are anomalies. It has fallen upon us to defend this freedom, to stop the neighbor killer who doesn't hide their intentions to destroy our state. It was destined for us to defeat fascism.